recording on Zoom today, but um, it's going to be in speaker view. So as long as you're not speaking, the camera will be on anyone who is speaking. So um, yeah, you will not be recorded. Um, and then if you have questions throughout today's workshop, um, feel free to put them in the chat at any time. Also, you can add them to the Q&A doc that we'll put the link in the chat. You can also find it in the hyperdoc, which we'll also put that link in the chat, but you also could find it in other places. <laughs> um, and then in the last workshop, everyone was very much so considerate to just all of these Zoom guidelines, and we're just very thankful to that and to all of you. Um, so aloha and welcome. Uh, one more reminder for everyone, we really, really hope um, you all have your flowers because we're gonna be venturing into the world of flowers today. So that's really exciting. We're gonna be um, guided throughout I can go the day. Help her. Most of the day. Um, I can go help her, yeah. Yeah. So, okay. No, I, I can go. Um, anyway, so if you do not have flowers, um, Please take this time to get flowers. If you have flowers, awesome. Um, anyway, to open this workshop up today um, and to honor this just be beautiful virtual space, uh, I'm gonna hand it off to Sebastian to guide us through our mindful moment. Aloha. Aloha everyone. Can you all hear me okay? My speaker keeps acting up a lot. Yeah, all right, great. So I hope this isn't too long, but I wrote this mindful moment because I'm just feeling so really inspired by all of you. And I just really feel that all of you have such potential. And, and I was just, I just feel inspired to write this. So here it is. But anyways, I, I just wanted to, it's just such a privilege beyond words to be in this sacred space with all of you here today to open up this special time with all of you inspiring people and to ground ourselves for all the precious mana o about to be shared. Let's take a moment. Let's take a moment to find some space within ourselves, just as we find space within each other. Ground yourself in the earth beneath your feet. Feel the sky that rests above your, that rest above us all. And let that life giving energy of the earth flow through you and feel it energize you as if it were, as if it were coming from the light of a thousand suns. And recognize and give thanks to the fruits of life, to all the blessings that surround ourselves every day. Let us take some time to be still and breathe deeply, understanding that the ebb and flow of life lives within each and every one of us. We have planted these seeds of hope. We are now sending our roots deep and we are blossoming. We are opening into the beautiful blossoming flowers that all of you are. There is a rising consciousness on this earth today. And this rising consciousness is not found without, but found within. It is a golden consciousness. One that lives in the tides of the soul. And it is a tide, but even more, it is a sun, a rising sun. The sun rises every day, but this sun is different from the sun we meet each morning. It's not yellow, it's golden. There are no polluted skies, only blue skies. There are no airplanes, only birds. The beautiful melodies of the birds, the crystal clear dew drops of the morning. The first sunshine of spring, the earth is warming. The morning sings with the conviction and virtue of the new era. And this cannot be stopped because I said before, this is a sun and nothing can stop the sun from rising. Clouds and pollution, they only blocked it and they too are departing. 
if it be to the wisdom of all those who sing these beautiful melodies of spring, if we can find within, we can find without something more about what life is all about and find no more doubt, we will find how we can rise just the same. And we are that sun. We are that sun that is rising on the eastern horizon. We are that heartbeat, that bird song, and that rising consciousness. We are a flower that is now opening into a beautiful blossom of hope. Here today, as we embark on this journey of our own, but a journey through all realms just the same, we open these petals to the dawn of a new day. And that pollen of life pierces through every atom of our bodies, every faculty of our mind, every life force within the soul. Today, we travel through the realms of the blossom and the gifts that they bring to our spirits through their, through their beauty and serenity, to our minds, through their clarity of the ages, through their symbolic fertility that pollinators bring to us all. We can all be a pollinator, a bee, and a butterfly that spreads the pollen of life to the far corners of our communities and our earth. We can all be a pollinator and we can all be one today. We only need to see beyond the life of the seed and the vigorous growth of these plants that now flourish in our gardens and in our hearts. We only need to look beyond the stretches of earth and the expanses of the horizon against the backdrop of the meadow where flowers are ablaze and all the colors of reality and imagination. It is time we head into this meadow of flowers and examine the blossom, observe the bees, the butterflies, the dragonflies, and dig our hands into the rich and loamy soil so that we can understand how we ourselves can perpetuate this legacy of blossoming intelligence and beauty and actually become it so that from this meadow, we may create our own meadow and yet more meadows to come until the, until the entire surface of the earth is ablaze in these vivid colors, these colors of strength, these colors of love, these colors of prosperity. And these meadows will live on. And they will live on through all the challenges that we may face when our challenges are at our apex, even, even, even when climate change and even when society seems against us, when the odds seems against us, we will remember those meadows. We have seen those meadows. We have smelled the flowers. We have walked upon the fertile soils of the forest. And because of that, the meadows will always flourish. The mighty trees of the forest will always stand strong. The gardens of nature and the gardens of our own will always live together in harmony and respect. As the awosis of the great spirit is the awosis of every spirit and the paradise of every soul, the dream of every mind, the sustenance of all physical manifestation and the abundance of humankind. This is a vital truth to which no one can deny. Here in this space today, we hold our gratitude for each and every one of you who have chosen to plant these seeds, water these seeds, tend to these plants, and blossom together as an Ohana community. So strong and so hopeful and so virtuous, passionate and compassionate that nothing can ever shake our foundation and nothing can ever uproot the growth of this movement. Our roots have been, have been taken not to be broken, but to be nourished. That nothing can strip our beautiful flowers and ruin our fruits that we, the Ohana trees, seed savers, beekeepers and change makers have produced through our knowledge, dreams, passions, that no storm can erode our topsoils, which we maintain through our healthy root system. Now, as we establish the foundations of dreams, knowledge, and community participation, we wish to remind each and every one of you that we are all, that though we are all guiding you on this journey to become seed savers, we wish that you all, we wish to remind you that we wish that you all make something unique out of it because all of us are unique in our own special ways. Wherever this may come, wherever you find uncertainty, wherever you may find some form of monoculture in which you are expected to be something, do remember through it all, journey through seed and journey through life, 
that you become who you were and who you will come to be, that you become someone you know yourself to be, someone in your heart, not someone apart, someone who, someone who knew you from the start, not some, from someone who told you who you are. Here at Seeds of Hunua, that is at our, car, at our core, to be inclusive and to give something more. We will, we will learn many things on this journey. Do remember, we are not in a hurry. The information we are now learning is not something we will learn once before buried in the seas of the intellect. It is something to which we will reflect. This is knowledge to which we learn to collect, to store, to plant, and to grow into yet more and more knowledge. Even all this, this wisdom that we learn, that we share, it is the seed that seeks to repair. Within every seed is the potential for thousands and even millions of seeds. These are the seeds for future seasons. This is a season for clarity and reason. We are all teachers, we are all learners. This is a truth we must embrace today. Within every seed, there is a hope. Within every seed, there is a pattern, a pattern for growth. There is a potential and this potential we all know. For all those who have planted a seed, they know what it means to truly watch something grow. It is embedded in the memory and it beats in their hearts because within every seed there is a symbol, a teaching with which it does well to be heated and resembled. Just as the seed has a pattern of growth and potential, we too have a pattern. When we watch that seed sprout and grow into the blossoming being, we are reminded that we can do just as the flower does. We are reminded of our true potential. We are reminded that it's only by supporting our own unique personalities that culture is healed, that our world is healed, and that we can heal too. Thank you. And that said, it gives me the greatest pleasure to hand it off to our guest speaker, Ilana Stout, who will be guiding us through pollination and flower morphology. Thank you. Mahalo, Sebastian. That was beautiful. What a wonderful beginning. A really wonderful beginning. Aloha kakahiaka everyone and welcome. It is my very great pleasure to be here today. My name is Alana Stout and we're going to be talking about flowers today. So I'm going to start off by sharing a PowerPoint. It just started raining here. Do I need to put on my headset or can you hear okay? Okay. All right. And I, we, you, everybody will have access to these slides. Um, we'll be sharing a PDF with the, of this. So if there's information you'd like to come back to, or if you're an educator and you want to use these slides or, or use information from them, that's fine. All right. So we're going to start off with an icebreaker in the breakout rooms, about 10 minutes. Um, and the first thing I want you to do is just reintroduce yourselves um, and choose a timekeeper and somebody who's going to be the recorder or reporter. So the timekeeper is going to keep an eye on the time and make sure we all come back to the main room together. Um, and then the recorder and reporter is going to write things down. Um, and the questions you're going to answer is what does your group already know about flowers and flower parts? So brainstorm as much as you can about flowers and flower parts. What does your group already know about pollination and how pollination occurs? And then what does your group want to learn today about flowers and pollination? And the facilitators in your rooms will have these questions too. So you should be, um, and I'll drop them in the chat also. So you should be able to refer back to them. All right, so, so um, Debbie, can you, and we're gonna now go back into these breakout rooms and in our breakout rooms, we're going to do a little exploration of our flowers. And the, we're gonna do this in a series of steps. Your facilitator will guide you the first step is to share your flowers with the group. Just make sure that everybody in the group, you can hold your flower up here so everybody has an idea of what flower you're working with. 
Choose your flower with the most visible inside parts. You're gonna use your magnifier and take a minute to draw a picture of your flower in your journal. The facilitator will then guide you through a dissection on the flowers and different folks are gonna find different things. We're really exploring what we find in these flowers because we have such a wide diversity of flowers across the group. Um, we're gonna compare what we can find inside of flowers. Um, if you've never torn up a flower before, today is the day that you're gonna get to do that. And then you're gonna compare the parts of your flowers in, in your group and look at how are they similar and how are they different. So we're gonna spend about 20 minutes on this. Um, in the, uh, the room that I'm at in with the educators, the breakout room, we're actually gonna end a little bit sooner on the flower dissection and go into talking about parts a little earlier. And then we'll go through a second round of talking about parts when everybody is back, just so that we can go into some terminology. Any questions about that process? All right. If you've got a flower, you may want to have your camera on so you can share your flower. Um, and let's start with on your flower. Or maybe you have a hibiscus. Oh, that's wonderful. Thanks, Joe. Excellent. So we're going to start off with the parts that we are really familiar with. And the most noticeable part, the part that most students know, is these big showy parts of the flower, which are the petals. Yeah. So petals are a really great one to start with. Um, they're easy to, you can remove them pretty easily. Um, you can use a scissor, but I really like to do this so that it's like the kind of thing. Um, they're one of the reasons I introduced this as a flower exploration, not a flower dissection, is I like the idea of people being able to do this in the garden, like to explore how different flowers look in the garden. So you don't have to take it into a lab situation or something like that. So let's go ahead and carefully remove all of the petals when you're removing the petals, pay attention. You may have, I have this different type of modified petal underneath. This is actually called a sepal. That's what protects the bud. So see if there's different types of petals and just very carefully remove the petals from your flower. You can use the scissors or you can just rip them off with your fingers or you can use that toothpick or pin that you have. Please feel free to raise your hand or just unmute yourself and ask as you have questions. So we're carefully removing those petals. So what I now have is this flower that says just the sepals. Those are those bottom modified petals that sometimes on a hibiscus, the sepals will look a little bit more like showing you flowers. Here. It's the stem. Yeah. Jessica, were you in a different room? Did, did you just join us in this room? No, I was in this one. I'm just mobile, so okay. the service oh, drops. So I have to cool. jump back in. No worries. Um, okay, so then I would go ahead. Then one of the things that you can do with the petals that's a, a, a good activity is to then look at these with a magnifier and see, do you see any stripes, any patterns on them? Um, if you have a UV light, this is a really good time to turn off the light and look at them with a UV light. Um, petals have lines and patterns. This is off of a hibiscus to help direct the pollinators towards the nectar. The whole idea of this flower, Anna, stop. The whole idea of this flower is to get the uh, pollinators into the middle of it to help with pollination. 
So this is a great time to really look at those lines, look at how that flower is structured that helps with pollination. And then you're gonna go ahead, I'm gonna remove the sepals on this too. And take your flower and see, are there any parts, What? where are the parts that have the pollen on it? The pollen is usually kind of dusty. It'll come off on your fingers sometimes. I usually introduce it as dusty. These are a little bit wet because it's been raining. Those parts with the pollen are the male parts, those dusty parts. Ali, I think those flowers might be a little bit small for dissection for this for today, but you might be able to find them in there. And then go ahead and remove one of those male parts and you can on your paper next to your flower, See if the pollen, if you can smear the pollen on the paper there, does it make a mark? And this is a great way to compare the different colors of pollen in different plants. So then after you've done that, after you've found those, those male parts with the pollen on them, there's usually several of them. You're gonna see, are there any parts that are a little bit sticky? And usually, it's not sticky on here, but usually that part, so you'll have the dust, dusty pollen and then the stigma, which is the central part of the female part is usually a little bit sticky. So we're gonna see, are there any sticky parts on our flowers? And again, looking with your hand lens at each of these parts, how are they different? Let's see if I, if I move the camera a little bit, this might be better. I'll go like this. And you can see those, this is the stigma which is the top of the carpal, that's the female part. We'll go over all this terminology in a minute. And then these are actually modified petals on this one. So I'm gonna remove these two. So we've got the male parts here. We've got the female parts here. And then if we take the, if we follow the, from the stigma down the middle of the carpal to the bottom of the flower, there should be a swollen part here at the bottom of your flower. Not always, not all flowers. Some flowers are just male or some flowers are just female. That's the ovary. And you can, with a pin or a needle, you can open up that ovary and look inside of it. So I've got this neat tool and I can cut this open. and look inside of it. The ovary at the base of the flower, it was actually further in there than that. Whoops, hold on, let me pull this up for a second. At the base of the flower, it, there should be an ovary that you can cut open and looks like that is not the ovary on that flower. This is actually just an extension of the petals. I haven't dissected one of these ones before. There's the ovary. This is the ovary down here, this swollen part. You can cut that open and that is the part that holds the ovules, which are the immature eggs. And those immature eggs will become the seeds and the ovary will become the fruit. Anybody need help? Anyone have, everybody having, anyone having cool things to show? 
Let me actually, I'm going to do this. So if I do a hibiscus and I remove the petals, here's the ovary down at the bottom of the carpal. We can come all the way down to the bottom of the carpal. Cut that swollen ovary open. And you can look at that uh, in, on the inside of the hand lens, or if you have a microscope, really good to look with the microscope. On this, on this particular flower, this hibiscus, when I open the ovary, I can also see very carefully, attached to the ovary, there is this tube. There's a thin, how do I get this? There's this thin tube that goes all the way up. That's the pollen tube that the pollen is gonna travel through. It goes all the way up the style to the stigma. And then down here at the bottom is the ovary and you can actually cut that open and look for, look for the ovules. Anybody have any neat parts to share? Oh, Tyler, you're back a little early. Excellent. Sorry. We're just going to start talking about, no, don't, no, sorry. We're just going to start talking about words in a second. Yay. Yay. Excellent. So let's talk about what some, are some of these parts that you, you might find. And again, I encourage you to dissect more than one flower and to look for what's similar in multiple flowers. You can't, I can't see it, but I can feel it. Yeah, that's how some of them will be. Okay, so in a flower, there's a couple of different ways that flowers can be set up. Flowers can have, um, a plant can have the male and female parts on the same flower, or those can be on different flowers or sometimes those are on different plants. So in this flower, this is a simplified flower, we have, these are those dusty male parts, the pollen, which is on the male parts is out here. And I'm just gonna go ahead and write the names of these parts on here. This is the, actually, this is the anther. And it's on top of the, the filaments. Is that skinny, skinny part of the male parts? And those together. are called the, anybody know what those two parts together are called? It starts with an S. Style? Close. Stamen. 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 Yeah, the stamen. stamen. It, has yeah. The word, it has the word men in it, and that's how I remember that that's the male parts. So these are the, these are the science names for the male parts. The anther, which is the top and holds the pollen. The filament, which is this thready looking thing. And then the stamen. The female parts, and again, you don't have to include these all the time, um, the, all these names, just knowing the male and female parts is important. The female parts, let me choose a different color. We'll make this purple. This top part, this is the female part here in the middle. This top part is called the stigma. And then we have, this is the style. And then down here, this swollen part, does anybody remember what the swollen part at the base is called? Starts with an O. Ovary. Ovary, that is the ovary, yeah, excellent. And you can see it's hold some ovules there. 
Makes me wonder where where the word stigma comes from. I'm thinking about that. (laughs) That is interesting. Yeah. Yeah, the etymology of things. Yeah. These three parts together, the stigma, the style, and the ovary. These three parts. Have a spe- have another name, which is the. Anybody know? Any guesses? It starts with a C. Carpal. carpal. The carpal. The carpal is the female parts altogether. The stamen is the male parts altogether. Like, like there we go. Okay, so then, um, and you may have also heard the word pistil. Pistil is when there's several carpals that are all all combined together. Uh, Debbie, not quite yet. I'll go over the male and female. I'm gonna do one more thing with the language and then we should bring everybody back. Um, So if you have the male and female parts all, all in the same flower, this is called a um, perfect flower. Perfect flowers have male and female parts all in the same flower. So we can also have a setup where next slide. Okay. We can also have a setup where we have the female on one flower and the male on another flower. These are called imperfect flowers. And we can also have a setup, whoops, sorry folks, where they're on totally separate plants. These are also called imperfect flowers. Now, terminology, science terms wise, this is kind of a neat thing. If they're on separate plants entirely, they are called, oh my gosh, sorry folks. They are called, these are called dioecious or dioecious, sometimes it's pronounced, which means two house. If you have them on the same plant, these are imperfect flowers also. But they are called monoecious which means one house. So these are all living in the same house on the same plant. If they are on the same flower, they're called monoclinus. And again, these are perfect. Monoclinus means one bed. So one bed, one house, and two house. So that tells you a little bit about how these plants are pollinated. Um, And if we don't have everybody back yet, can we pull everybody back now? Debbie? Yep, got it. Thank you. Almost have everyone back. Yeah, excellent. So again, if we go through plant, if we talk about flowers, there's um, when pollination occurs in perfect flowers where you have the, these are the male parts and this is the female part. If they're in the same flower, the pollen moves from 
the stamen from the male parts to the female parts. The pollen forms a long tube. It goes down through this female part all the way down here. And it fertilizes these ovules and those ovules become seeds. And then this ovary, that swollen part becomes the fruit. These again, what were these, what are these kind of flowers called if they're all in the same place? Can you remind me somebody? Is there's with a P? Perfect. If there's perfect. Perfect oh, no, flowers. Male and female are in the same flower. That's a perfect flower. It's perfect. Okay. Um, if they are in If they're in separate flowers, so over here, over here we have the male parts, and over here we have the female parts. These are separate flowers on the same plant. Same thing, a similar thing is gonna happen where the pollen goes from this flower over to this plant, over to this flower, or it could come from another plant too, or it could come from another flower on the same plant. Um, in perfect flowers, usually they get pollen from the same plant. In imperfect flowers, these are imperfect. They get they can get uh, pollen from the same plant or from another plant. So this is an imperfect flower, separate flowers. And then this is another way that flowers can be imperfect where you have different plants entirely. We're gonna do it. If this is, seems like a lot right now, we're gonna do a little review about different uh, pollination strategies right after the break. This one is also called imperfect. Imperfect, separate, this is a male flower over here. And then a female flower on the other side of the screen. Male plant, female plant. So let's, that's at the very most easy level, I wanna make sure everybody understands those two different types of big types of flowers. So again, we have, these are, everybody say it with me now, it starts with a P, what kind of flower is this? Perfect. Perfect, yes. Perfecto. Perfecto Perfect. flowers. These ones are? Imperfect. 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 This Imperfect. one is? Imperfect also, wonderful, wonderful. I Yes, <laughs> yes, mm -hmm. and then we have that. If you want to fo focus also on the Latin names, those are good ones to practice too. So perfect flowers usually are self-pollinated. That means they get pollen from the same plant because the male and female parts are all in the same flower. Sometimes we call them selfers. Imperfect flowers can get pollen from a different plant. So they can be cross-pollinated. They can combine with a different uh, different plant of the same species, and we call those outcrossers. Kind of important terms to know. Self-pollination tends to be with perfect flowers. Imperfect flowers can be cross-pollinated. They can be outcrossers. And I think we're just about ready for our break. Is that right? That's about right. Thank you so much, Ilana. What an incredible flower journey it's been so far, right, everyone? Yeah. And I know that some folks have had questions. If you put questions in the chat box, I will try to answer them during the break. And we'll see you in, is it five minutes or is it 10 minutes, Tyler? Yeah, we're gonna now take like just a five minute break, get some water, something to eat, go to the bathroom uh, or anything else you feel like you need to do. We'll see you back in about five minutes. Um, thank you, Tyler. And thank you, Debbie. I hope everybody had a great break. And I, some of you probably went back and looked at some of those other flowers. I'd like to really encourage you 
to get in the habit of looking at flowers. There's imperfect ones out there. There's perfect ones. There's flowers that are what we call aggregate, where we have many flowers in one flower. So like a sunflower. Um, there's things like this that are really complicated, actually flowers. This is probably multiple flowers and these are all the male parts on the outside. So I could, I now like that I know a little bit about what the simple flowers look like. I can get into day dissecting these more complicated things and start imagining getting curious about what's going on with this plant. What does this plant want in order to reproduce? A couple questions from the chat box before we dive into the next part. Debbie asks, can sulfurs get pollen from the same flower or does it have to be two different perfect flowers on the same plant? Great question. Sulfurs generally are self-pollinated. Remember that those sulfurs, let's pull that picture back up real quick. That those sulfurs, or this is usually what we call a sulfur, a perfect flower. Um, then where we have the male and the female parts in the same plant. So the pollen can move by wind or, or more likely it could have be a little insect like ant can just move a little bit, a bit of pollen from one place to another or even some of the pollen can fall off. Generally on a self pollinating plant on a sulfur, it's gonna get pollen from the same um, plant. It's gonna get pollen from that same flower. Now there's exceptions to the rule. Some sulfur or some perfect flowers have like a carpel that hangs way out over here so they can pick up pollen from other flowers too. But generally self-pollinating plants perf with per are, have perfect flowers and they're able to get pollen from the same flower. Great question. Um, how do you know if a plant has perfect or imperfect flowers or can it have both? Um, so there are some types of plants, we'll talk about this a little bit later, that have both perfect or imperf and imperfect flowers. Um, uh, typically a plant has either perfect or imperfect. You can look and see, do you see the male and female parts on that flower? And if you can't see it clearly on your own flower or with your magnifying glass, and again, I really recommend using those magnifying lenses on flowers as much as you can. If you can't really clearly see if it has male or female parts, you can um, do a quick Google search or a quick internet search for a picture of that flower that's been dissected. Most of these flowers that are on our food plants, especially, you can find uh, dissection video or dissection images of them online. So I was one that leads kind of directly into this next question about the plumeria flowers that Marielle said. Yeah, we'll, we'll get to that in a second, Debbie. That's on going to be on one of our scenarios. Um, uh, the what Mar what Marielle was asking about with our plumeria flowers. Plumeria is a really interesting one because what happens is most of the reproductive parts of that flower, I just looked this up online and this is, I Google searched plumeria, um, what did I look for? Plumeria reproduction image or plumeria, plumeria flower dissection um, would work too. And I found this and this is what's going on with plumeria. Those parts are way back in what looks like part of the stem. It's way back connected into that very base part of the flower. Um, so it's not up in the, near the petals. An interesting thing about plumeria is that plumeria, we tend to grow from cuttings, right? It's often grown from cuttings, not from flowers. So we might be seeing there, I'm not sure I'm not an expert on plumeria, that because we grow that plant from cuttings so much, its flower reproduction has gotten kind of weird. It's not that interested in making seeds anymore as a plant because humans keep propagating it from cuttings. That's kind of what's happening with bananas too. Bananas have gotten kind of, they're different than a lot of other, like they don't produce seeds, right? That's because human beings propagate them mostly through vegetative propagation. Oh, you just got seeds from your plumeria. That's cool, that's cool. Yeah, 
I'm sure they still do it. I just don't know if it's like, that might be why it's not as showy on them as on some other flowers. Maybe, maybe. Some of this stuff we just, we just guess at. Okay, we're gonna go back into the PowerPoint and we're gonna do a little um, practice with thinking about perfect and imperfect flowers. Again, perfect flowers, male and female parts, all in the same flower, imperfect in different flowers or on different plants. And we're gonna do a little practice with thinking about sulfurs or outcrossers. So, let's see. There we go. There we go. All right. So I'm going to ask that as we go through each of these flowers, I'll point out a few things. And I want you to, in the chat box, say whether you think it's perfect or imperfect, and whether you think it's a sulfur or an outcrosser, based on looking at the flowers. We're going to look at some flowers from mostly from food plants. All right. So tomato flowers. If we look at tomato flowers, they look at on the inside like this. We have this, these are the, these are dusty pollen-y parts on here. And we have this large central structure here with a swollen part at the bottom. What do you think about tomatoes? Perfect or imperfect? What do we think about those flowers? Just go ahead and type that in the chat. And is it a sulfur or an outcrosser? Seeing some awesome responses in the chat. Perfect and sulfur. Yeah. So please just type in the chat what you think it is. Oh. Nobody wants to make a guess. So remembering we have this part in the middle with this swollen part at the bottom, that's the ovary at the bottom. And then on the outside of the flower or the outside of this part here, we have these stamen that have the pollen on the top of them. Would that make this a perfect or an imperfect flower? Can you, no see that? Can, you What's that? can you see the chat? It's going I crazy. Can't, I can't see the chat. I, I it's not oh. showing anything in chat. Okay. Sorry. All right, so people perfect. we got perfect selfers, perfect flower, perfect, perfect, All perfect. Right. Perfect. All right. Okay, that makes sense. I thought if people were being super shy. Um, it's perfect. You're right. And it is a selfer. Excellent. Okay, this is our next one. Squash, pumpkins, and melons. And we talked a little bit about this in our group, how a lot of times there'll be different timing on the different types of flowers on these plants. We have this type of flower here, which is this type of flower. If we cut it open, we would see it has anthers on a stamen, and we would have over here, if we cut this open, this is actually the ovary. Sometimes people will think that's a fertilized fruit, but it's not until it gets fertilized. It has to get fertilized. On the second flower, is this flower perfect or imperfect? And is it a sulfur or outcrosser? Imperfect? Imperfect. Outcrosser. Yes. Nice. Yes. So this plant, um, squashes, pumpkins, and melons, which are in the family Cucurbitaceae, or cucurbit, sometimes they're called. The, in order for you to get squashes, pumpkins, or melons, these need to be fertilized. Sometimes, if you don't have the right insects around, people will go and they'll go ahead and they'll take the male flowers and use them to fertilize the female flowers, which can increase your fruit production. Also, this could get pollinated by a male flower on a totally different plant. So important to think about that. If I wanna keep a 
variety pure. I need to think about that kind of thing. All right, peas and beans. We've got some beans in our seed packets. Peas and beans, if we open this up, they have very interesting flowers. This is a characteristic legume flower. They have these different uh, major petals. And if we look inside, we will see that there is a stigma and an ovary and that there are also anthers. So perfect or imperfect, so far out processor. And this is a perfect flower and a selfer. It's kind of funny to do this without being able to see the chat box at all. It's a little uh, strange. I'm seeing some incredible responses in the chat. Amazing job. Awesome. Excellent. These are really fun to look in. And these are a characteristic, again, legumes are really cool. They're nitrogen fixing plants. One of my favorite groups of plants is leguminous plants. I love them. Peas and beans. All right, corn, corn, we have, this is what let's call the corn silks. It's lower down on the plant and this is up at the top of the plant. These are both flowers. These silks are the, um, it, this is the out, outer part of the carpal and these up here are covered with pollen. These tassels up at the top, pollen up here on the tassels the ear, which is where the fruit grows. So that gives you a clue that there's ovaries there. The silks, perfect or imperfect, sulfur or outcrosser. Two different flowers means it is imperfect and it is a outcrosser. That means if I grow corn and there's another variety of corn or another kind of corn growing in the next field over, it can cross into my corn, really, really important. Um, and if you are a social studies teacher looking into that in some of the uh, stuff that's going on with corn in Mexico, there's some really interesting stories coming out of there. Really interesting stuff, historical varieties and how to preserve them. Okay, one more plant and then we're gonna have a short story and then we're gonna go on to a different activity. So this is kind of an unusual one, dioecious. We went over that word. In date palms, we have female trees and we have male trees. The male's trees, the entire tree is male, has anthers. The female tree contains, is the one that has the carpels containing the ovules. These are perfect or imperfect, sulfur or outcrosser. We know if they're on separate plants, it's gonna be imperfect. We know that means they're an outcrosser. And the way that these are actually pollinated is by wind. Wind will carry the pollen from the male plant to the female plant. So this leads into a really cool story uh, that I think is just fascinating about date palms. Um, Nancy talked to us a little bit about the importance of stories around plants. Um, this is Methuselah. And Methuselah is a ancient variety of date palm that was sprouted from a seed that was 2,000 years old. So they found this 2,000 year old ancient seed in a um, excavation. It was, it was uh, stored in ceramic very common food, food crop from 2000 years ago. And this variety actually went extinct 800 years ago. So there are no more of this variety growing other than Methuselah. Methuselah is the only one growing. Um, so that's why they've, they've put up this gate to protect from, uh, probably from animals. So really interesting thing about this is that they grew Methuselah. They were able to get this 2000 year old seed to sprout, which is pretty incredible. But because these are imperfect plants, because it's a dioecious plant and there's a male and a female plant, Methuselah is um, unable to reproduce because Methuselah, this, is, this tree itself, 
is a male tree and there's no female trees out there. So Donna Metz is making a joke about Methuselah being the date palm that couldn't get a date. Get it? <laughs> so this is, that's a really interesting um, th thing to think about. And when we're talking about these ancient varieties, old varieties, what um, there, there's been some other really cool stories. Like there was a really interesting story about a ancient uh, Native American squash that was found recently. And are they able to reproduce based on what we know about their pollination biology? Okay, so going, going into uh, any questions at that point before we jump in? They could try cuttings. Those are great ideas. Yeah, so I think one of the things that they're actually trying to do is to take a, its closest relative and cross it with its closest relative. So that's fine, a female of the close, of a modern date palm, basically. So they would have, they would be able to preserve some of those genes from that ancient variety at least. So we are going to, they should give him plant friends. <laughs> yeah, yeah, that would be good to have a guild of other plants around there. Um, we're going to talk about another major concept in seed saving and in uh, pollination, which is hybridization. Um, and go over real quickly, what is a hybrid variety? So this is a term you may have heard of. Sometimes you'll buy seed and it'll say F2 on it, and that means hybrid, or it'll say a hybridized seed. A hybrid is a cross between two things. So a cross between, for example, a um, donkey and a horse, we call a mule. A mule is a hybrid. That's the scientific term for a hybrid. When we're talking about plants, usually we're talking about a cross between two different varieties. So imagine that you're a farmer or a seed grower and you have this beautiful purple bean. This is my very fancy artwork here. This beautiful purple bean, it's a gorgeous color of purple. The people at the market love buying this purple bean because it's so showy but it only makes like two or three beans max per clump or per bract. And then there's this other variety that it, it's the color is not nearly so flashy, but it makes many, many beans per bract. If I were to take a purple bean because a purple this because beans and peas are perfect flowers, in general, they tend to be self-pollinating. If I take this variety and I plant it, this purple variety, I'm gonna get a plant that looks just like it. If I take this green variety and I plant it, I'm gonna get a plant that looks very much just like it. I can also go in to the flower, remove the stamen from one and take it over and fertilize the other plant. And I can cross the two of these. And if I cross the two of these plants, I can get a plant that is a combination of the two. And seed breeders do this frequently to get special traits, combinations of traits between plants. This is part of the reason we have a lot of the unique food plants we have is because they're these combo combinations of traits. It's, it's one part of the reason. This is a hybrid. It's a cross between two parental lines that are very different. And we have, now we have many purple beans and I can harvest many, many purple beans and I can sell them at the market and I'm thrilled about that, that's great. But if I take this hybrid variety and I plant it because it's a hybrid, its offspring will not necessarily look like this. Its offspring could look like this parent, this grandparent over here or this green grandparent over here, or any combination of the two traits. So we call the grandparent varieties, we, or the parent varieties here, these are the, this is the parental generation. Those are op, what we call open pollinated. Open pollinated means that if I plant that, it's gonna look like the plant that it came from. This is a hybrid. 
If I plant seeds from a hybrid, they will not necessarily, most of the time, they will not look like the plant that they came from. So seeds out of these purple beans here will not look, produce a plant that looks like this. So open pollinated varieties grow what we call true to type, meaning the offspring look like the parents. And hybrid varieties do not grow true to type. The offspring of hybrid varieties can look like one of the grandparents, or it can look like any combination of their traits. If you're seed saving, which of those do you think would be better to save from? If you're trying to save a special particular variety, which is better? True to type. Yeah, that open pollinated, those open pollinated varieties that are true to type. Yes. Those are the ones that we want to save seed from. Those are the easier ones to save seed from. Now, I think it's important to point out, yeah, open pollinators, heirlooms are generally open pollinated, absolutely. Um, not all open pollinated varieties are heirlooms, but heirlooms are generally open pollinated. There are people out there who are very advanced seed savers. There's a guy named Frank Morton. If you're into this, it's worth looking up his videos who do things called what's breaking hybrids where they will take hybrid varieties and grow them for many generations and try to create new true to type lines. But that's like super advanced, super, super advanced um, seed saving. So when you're starting off seed saving, start with open pollinated, start with perfect flowers. That's a, and all the plants that you've gotten and your, all the seeds you've received are perfect and are open pollinated. Okay, how are we doing on time? Do we have time to do these, these, these thinking about it scenarios? I'd say we have time to do at least one or two. Um, there's, I noticed there are some really interesting questions in the chat. One Eva just brought up, um, she says, put an apple in an orange tree and you get a red crunchy citrus fruit. I was thinking, that would be, yeah. Uh, that would be incredible so thought, but I was thinking, Lana, if you wanted to elaborate on just like how hybridizing that's, works. And that's a really good point. Thank you. Species. That's a really good point. So um, when I'm talking about hybridization in plants, it's a little bit than, different than hybridization in animals because we talked about a, a like a donkey and a mule can, or sorry, a donkey and a horse can create a mule or a liger is a real thing. A lion, a lion and a tiger can actually create a liger. Those are different species that can create, uh, that can have offspring. That offspring is not fertile. Um, in plants, when we hybridize, we're not talking about different species. We're talking about like, uh, different varieties of the same species. I was going to show you with a tangerine, but I don't have another citrus. So I could take two different types of uh, apples and cross those because apples are both the same species. So maybe like a red delicious and a, a Fuji apple, I could cross those two because they're the same, they're the same species, um, but they're different varieties of that same species. But because an apple and an orange are different species, we cannot actually cross an apple and an orange. But if we could, I, that would be probably one of my favorite foods. I would love very much. Um, so there's actually like a thing called a pluot that's a cross between, I think, a plum and an apricot. That's because those are technically from the same, they're, the, they're both prunus. They're, the, they're, they're closely enough related that they can be crossed. Any other questions that I missed in the box, in the chat box? Let's see, grafting. Oh, we could do a whole workshop on grafting. That is so cool. But yeah, grafting is different. That's working with vegetative, vegetative reproduction. We're, this, is a, this is sexual reproduction. This is recombination combination of um, the traits from male and female parts of the plant. Red, crunchy, orange. Okay. So then our next thing we're gonna do is jump into our last activity is we're gonna do a few scenarios. Walk through a few scenarios. Um, and I'd like to do these in breakout groups. And there's three scenarios. These go from 
um, from kind of easier to harder things to think about. Uh, the grocery store tomato, the farmer's market papaya, and uncle's kabocha squash. So maybe what we could do is go into the breakout groups and um, the break, each group can choose which one or ones they wanna do. Sound good? So we'll go back into our groups and you know some groups might wanna try all three and some groups might just wanna do one or, one or two. And just a heads up for all the facilitators we'll, or for all the facilitators and all the participants in each group, we'll see you back here around 10.50 or 10.55 for our wrap up. Perfect. Thanks, Tyler. What about educators? Should I split you back out to two like we did in the beginning? Um, let's Maybe see if one. we have, yeah, actually it's actually educators can, uh, the, the, I don't have to be there to facilitate, but or we could just do as a big group, either way. Let's go ahead and split it into two. Okay. Thanks, Debbie. Oops. Only thing is now I need to correct, uh, create another room and I don't know if I can. Uh oh. Well, I'll go ahead and I'll put the stories into the chat box so we can start reading the stories on our own. Yeah, yeah. I think it looks like Patience is asking. Um, okay. I'm going to go to room three. All right. Wait, do you, go ahead and post it in here so they can get started. So here's our first story, the grocery store tomato. And this this is really the, we're starting with the simplest one and going to more the more complicated ones. Again, you're more than free to use all of these materials with your students um, and you will have access to the PDF. So that's, let's start with this one, the grocery store tomato. Oh, okay. Let's see. Oh yeah, um, I have um right, right. I'm gonna move you. Young Lin Lee. Is that how you say your name? Young Jin? Oh yeah, that's right. Okay. I have to figure out what room. So here's that story we're looking at the grocery store tomato. Should we can read it out loud if you like to do that. That might be easy. Should we answer in the chat box or should we? Um... Oh, let's just talk. Th the, the idea is just to talk through these really, to talk about what do we think. Based on the way that tomatoes are pollinated, do you think Keiko is right that she could save seeds from it reliably or is Keiko's sister right? that they'll be very different than the one that they brought in the store. It should be similar to the one that they bought in the store. Why do you say that? Um, because they bought an open pollinated variety. So mm -hmm. it should be like a stable seed that should reproduce a similar fruit to what they bought. Yep, yeah. yeah. So the open pollinated is gonna be true to type, tend to be true to type. And then also, what do we know about tomato flowers? They are perfect. They're perfect, yeah. So they're self, they're selfers. So op tomatoes are open, tomatoes are not all open pollinated. There are plenty of hybrid tomatoes out there. So mm -hmm. if they brought a hybrid tomato, maybe not. But since we know this is an open pollinated variety and it is from a, um, it's from a self-pollinating plant. We can save seeds from this plant and they should be similar to the parent plant. Now they're not gonna be grown in the exact same conditioners as the farmer that we bought, that grew it. So how we fertilize it and what we do in our garden is gonna affect the quality of the fruit, but the plant genetics itself should be the same. Okay, let's look at the next story. Let's see. This little bit tricky to navigate. This one, this one gets to something that, uh, let's 
see. This one gets to something that Joe brought up earlier, which is plants that have both perfect and imperfect flowers. Let me talk a little bit about this with Kaya. So there, I just put it into the chat box if you'd like, like it, and I'll also put it onto the, also share the screen. Let's take a minute to read through this one. I like seeing all those flowers right next to each other. That's pretty cool to see. This those. one, yeah. Yeah, the last, yeah, those, that's really awesome. Thank so you. So again, sure. again, this is something that I, I do quite a bit, which is if I'm not able to see, a fl I mean, I'll do my flower dissection, but if I'm like really unsure, you can find most food plants, you can find images of the flower on the internet too, to which can help you out. Um, I think that this is a really good image also. So papaya flowers, we have, can be male, can they be, they can be female, so or papaya plants rather, can be male or they can be female. You can have male and female plants, or you can have a hermaphrodite plant, which is, has perfect flowers. So saving papaya, if you got a papaya from the farmer's market and you don't know anything else about it, would it be a good idea to save seeds from that papaya? I would say no, uh, especially papayas. Why you especially papayas? Um, yeah, there's so many GMO varieties out there, especially in our farmers markets. Um, that's what I was gonna say I, too. I, hard, hard to I know. Say yes. Yeah. I want to argue the opposite side. <laughs> <laughs> if it has a perfect, if it has a perfect flower, uh, isn't it? Doesn't it have the potential to grow the same yeah. fruit? So I would think yeah. that you would want to save. And I grow a lot of papayas, and it's. Papayas are very easy to grow, so they I are. would say yes. They're such a good food resource, and they're really easy to grow from seed and save seed. So if you, the thing is though, if you don't know, and they do actually have the hermaphrodite fruits and the female fruits have slightly different shapes, but if you don't know if it's from a female plant or from a hermaphrodite plant, a perfect from a perfect flower, if it's from a female plant, it could have been crossed with any other pollen, so it could have could be an outcrossing. If you grow papayas and you're interested in saving seeds of varieties, the best idea is to save from the ones with perfect flowers. Those are the hermaphrodites. And sometimes people will also bag the flowers to make sure that they just self-pollinate. They don't get pollen from other places. So that's one, one of the things that you can do. Um, so yeah, they're both right in this case. And that's why this is kind of a complicated thing is it is potential that you could take that papaya and plant it and get a very, a, you know, a genetically identical plant if it came from a perfect plant, if it came from a hermaphrodite plant. If it came from a female plant, it probably won't be because it'll probably have crossed with something else. And, poll and papaya pollen can move far. This is the male flower here. I have a question. Yes. From the hermaphrodite seed, can that also be a female birth from the hermaphrodite? 
papaya seed? So hermaphrodite means it's male and female um, combined. So, yeah, so in that papaya, mm -hmm. those seeds, are they all going to be hermaphrodites or can they be oh, all the sexes? Yeah, yeah that's, a good, that's a good point. In any papaya, all the, the seeds could be hermaphrodite um, or female or female, which is why a lot of times papaya growers will grow three seeds so that you have a one-third chance. That's a really good question. Um, let's see about... Um, and then our last story. Yes, yes and no, but that's, that's a, and I, I threw that one in there because I want, I kind of wanted to have to point out that there are some complicated situations here um, and things that are worth thinking about. Um, digging a little deeper. One more, and this is a true story. Um, and I'm just calling him uncle because I'm, want to keep his uh, confidentiality. But as part of my uh, master's thesis, I interviewed people about seed stories, which was really fun. Um, and five years ago, I interviewed an uncle who had, not and, who had been um, keeping the same variety of kabocha squash in Hilo for almost 75 years. Um, so imagine someone moves in next door and to him and starts growing Halloween pumpkins. What might happen to that squash? Thinking about what we know about squash flowers. What could happen? It, it, could, it could cross with uh, another squash and the, Abs and the neighbors. Absolutely. absolutely, yeah. So it could cross out and there, they, it could be pollinated by the, a different uh, plant. So squash, particularly squash. Um, this is one of those things where if you've got a variety and you're trying to keep that variety pure and keep that variety going over years and years and years, um, we, um, there's things that people do in order to prevent outcrossing because this does happen all the time. Your neighbor or the neighbor, the farmer across the street starts growing the same thing as you. Um, and so we do different things about isol to isolate you can isolate by time. So you plant so it flowers at a different time than that one, or you can isolate by distance, or you can go out and you self pollinate the flowers and clip them. Um, I'm gonna share some additional resources for if you're an educator, if you're really interested in doing this um, in more detail, there's a really good webinar on um, isolation techniques, ways that we can protect special varieties. Okay, do we have everybody back? Not everyone, but it looks Nine. like we're all making their way back. Okay, sounds good. Um, so and we're just going to wrap up. Yeah, we'll start wrapping up. Yeah, perfect. So do you want me to go on to the, ne the next part, Tyler, or shall we wait for the rest of the room? Um, I think we can go on because they should be joining back soon. Sounds good. I went ahead and closed the room. It was just the one room that was left. Gotcha. But thanks for coming. Back. Okay. So in the chat, so we're going to start to wrap up today. What I'd like you to do um, when I was teaching in the classroom, we called this an exit pass. Think about what is one thing you learned today and type that into the chat box. And what is one question that you have for the next workshop? Donna Mitz is really going to be going into the details of how to harvest and save our seeds. What's a question you have? One thing you learned in a question. Not able to see the chat again. Zoom. My goodness. Well, um, people are saying they learned about imperfect flowers and perfect flowers. They loved the flower exploration. Um, Mommy saw an ovary, so cool. Uh, some people really like the last three questions about pollination. 
um, imperfect and perfect flowers, how hybrid plants work. Um, some people said that I thought the ovary was only in humans. Well done. <laughs> love it. That's great. I learned that there is two types of imperfect flowers. I love learning the connection between our bodies and plants. Me too. Love that. Love it. Love it. Okay. How so at uh, some people they want to they want to learn. Next workshop, how to save seeds from the plants that are growing. And Debbie said, I love how complicated it can be. Some people say they learned a lot today. Anyway, continue on. Wonderful. Okay, so for next week, um, thanks everybody for, for uh, all your shares and participation. Um, what I'd like you to do is observe at least five more flowers in your neighborhood or your yard. Um, and you know, it doesn't, you don't have to do a whole drawing, but it's a great idea to draw them in your journal um, and try to at least one draw and label the male and female parts. Um, so find some more flowers and take them apart and find those male and female parts. So you get comfortable with looking at flowers and figuring out, is this a perfect, is this an imperfect plant? It really matters for seed saving to know if you're working with a perfect or imperfect plant. And just kind of to get to know those plants. And then for each of those flowers, based on what you know about pollination biology, is it a selfer or is it an outcrosser? So we will send out these um, prompts to you so you don't have to write them down right now. I just want you to know what they are. And then these are some resources for um, educators and advanced students. These are the webinars that I mentioned from Seed Savers Exchange. This one about isolation distance is excellent and about population size. If you're, if you're seriously interested in growing and saving seed in large quantity, these are good things to get into. Um, this is a, this video on reproduction on flowering plants is from Amoeba Sisters. It's a cartoon summary of how flowering plants work. It's about 10 minutes long. And if you would like to do a, a activity where you dissect flowers and you go through a series of steps in more detail, this is an extension activity here. So you, everybody will have all of these um, links in the PDF. And I would just like to say mahalo to everybody. Thank you so much for coming. And what a wonderful day to talk about flowers. Wait, don't leave yet. Oh, don't I'm leave. not going. Yes, <laughs> don't leave, but thank you oh, so don't. much. Um, Debbie, would you like to talk about some of the stuff that everyone received in the mail or is going to receive in the mail? Yeah, so um, you should have gotten, hopefully you got an envelope with a few items in there. The magnifying lens was for today and in your journal prompts as you dissect more flowers over the next month, drop pictures. The rest of the supplies, please hang on to those somewhere in a cool dry place for the workshop on March 13th with Donna Mitz. The small orange beads are your silica beads for um, that you'll use as a desiccant. So just keep those tight. Don't let them out because they make a big old mess. Um, and same with like the coffee filter. And then there's a few supplies we're gonna ask you to bring yourself just cause they didn't fit well into mailing and it didn't make a whole lot of sense. So we wanna go over those real quick. Yeah, those, so that would include um, a two gallon bucket or container as you can see. Um, and then a small paper, and then you have to make sure the container either has a lid or is airtight. Um, and then a small paper plate or like a piece of cardboard for drying the seeds. Um, and then if you don't have your tomato plant fruiting that you're growing, or if you don't have tomato plants that you were already growing fruiting in your garden, um, please buy a tomato uh, three days ahead of, ahead of time for next workshop, which will be March 13th. Um, so buy it at least three days ahead. And then you're gonna need to and we'll send out detailed instructions for this, but you're gonna need to take out the seed contents uh, and pulp of the tomato, put it in a, a cup or so with a little bit of water, cover it with like a paper towel, um, seal it with like a, what's it called? Rubber band or something, uh, and then let that sit. And that's gonna just start with the fermentation process. And that's that will be explained in detail on March 13th and also in an email uh, closer to the date of March 13th. 
Excellent. Uh, yeah, and if you don't have time to do that or get the tomato ahead of time, if you could bring it to the workshop, Donna will be showing you how to scrape out the seeds and set up the fermentation. But she also wanted to show you the next step after fermentation of drying it. So you yeah. could have you could have both ready to go so you can try both at the same time. And then thanks as so much. Oh, I was just gonna say, as you can see um, in the chat, I think Marielle posted the post survey link, um, which can also be found in the hyperdoc. Do not forget to continue. Uh, so if you want, you can go start to fill that out um, or fill it out after, but we really encourage you to fill out and we really hope that you fill out the post survey. Um, and then do not forget to continue to share your thoughts and observations about your seed garden um, and your plants in your Kilo journal, along with the post workshop journal prompt we just discussed. Um, and then one thing, just making an announcement that we are having a uh, hosting another garden guidance session on March 6th at 9 a.m. to answer any questions you um, and anyone else may have about um, seeds, plants, or your garden. Uh, Master Gardeners volunteers will be available to help. So please bring you know any questions or problems or anything you're experiencing or facing or you wanna share with the group. Um, and then even if you don't have anything to ask, of course, it's gonna be an incredible time to learn and to listen. Uh, and then we're gonna provide a link in the chat for you to RSVP. Um, yeah, so we'll be in contact with you throughout the weeks ahead, providing, of course, more informational resources and materials via email. Um, and then for the Seeds of Honolulu Youth, we'll be having our um, Seeds of Honolulu Youth networking meeting next Saturday, which I will email you guys about again to invite you all. Um, before our next workshop, March 13th. We hope you take care of your garden. And then of course, if you have any questions, please email us or put them into the Q&A uh, doc and that you can find in the hyperlink. Um, so yeah, as of now, we'll take any questions and then go into a short, just closing. Anyone have any questions? I was hoping we'd close with our one word poem. Yeah, I have like a short, well actually it's getting late. So we can just do one word poem. Sure. Sure. Go. <laughs> okay. Uh, if you do have to jump off, if we could do our one word poem, um, this time looking for that word of where, how, where are you at now, how you're feeling after the session, workshop number two, and we'd really appreciate it. And you can go ahead and just type it at any time. Thanks, Julian. Gratitude. Fun. Eva. Awesome. Thank you guys for everything. Maze. Those can stay on. Tyler, what were you going to share? Oh, I just have like a short like thing I wrote, but it's like very short. Um, Go for it. Yeah. Okay. So, okay. Um, so we just have to, I'm just gonna, yeah, I'm just gonna read it. You don't need to close your eyes or anything. Um, <clears throat> flowers are the essence of pure beauty, the blossom of a, of a living legacy, enchanting in the way they dance upon your senses, their petaled dresses swaying in the wind, illuminating this world with color, texture, and fragrance. Um, their appearance never quite the same, shifting and evolving, reflecting the natural cycles of life and portraying life stages so eloquently. From the first light green bud to each and every flower's unique blossom, to the peaceful shedding of the last petal with the unspoken promise of fruit and seed, standing in their vivid soft flowers, power, standing in their vivid soft power flowers don't, um, don't demand attention, rather they just are as a rock sitting upon a mountainside or a cloud cradled by the sky. What happens when a flower loses its petals, turning golden and falling away? Is it a time to cry or a time to pray? for the promise of hope on the horizon for the coming of a new day. Um, please welcome that new day, that rebirth, the natural cycle of life, taking us right back to the beginning, the seed. Thank you guys. Oh, hello, Tyler, it's so beautiful. Wow. Everyone have a great day. It just started to rain here. I hope you're enjoying the weather wherever you are. Bye. Thank you. See you next month. Thank you.